welcome everybody to this really special event as part of the York Festival Ideas. We are doing First Light. My name is Emily Brunston and I'm an astronomer here at the University of York and I'm super excited to be able to present today's uh, speaker. First of all, I've got a few little technical things that you might want to hear about. So if you're watching live, you can ask questions throughout the entirety of today's talk using the Q&A button on the screen. So you can do this anytime. So questions will be uh, asked at the end. We'll have a Q&A session just then. If you have any technical issues, like you lose your Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the link that you got here from in the first place. Um, we noticed that today that this event is being recorded. So if you want to watch it again, then you'll be able to do that on YouTube. Uh, and I'll give you some more details of that at the end. And it's also nice to note we've got subtitles for this event. If you'd like to use subtitles, you can turn these on or off using the CC Live transcript button, which is found at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a laptop or if you look in the chat, there's instructions for how to do this on a mobile device. So as an astronomer and someone who studies stars, I am super excited to introduce today's speaker. So Emma Chapman is, uh, well, she's first of all, I guess, a Royal Society Research Fellow and Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society at Imperial College London. And she's definitely one of the world's most leading researchers in the search for the very, very first stars to exist in the universe, which is really, really cool. She's involved in lots of really amazing telescope projects, including the LOFAR, which is the Low Frequency Array in the Netherlands, and also what is one of my favorite telescopes, the upcoming and super optimistic Square Kilometer Array, which is gonna be uh, sort of across the entire world. This uh, new one that, that they're building, the Square Kilometer Array, it's gonna eventually consist of millions of antennas, making it one of the largest telescopes in the world. Now, Emma has a really, really long list of amazing um, sort of prizes and fellowships that she's won. I've started to write them all down, but then I thought this is getting a bit crazy. But I wanted to highlight two of them that I think are really, really amazing. First of all, she's the Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellow, and she's also got the STFC Ernest Rutherford Fellowship. Uh, if you haven't heard of these, they're two of the most prestigious science fellowships in the UK. So she's clearly amazing at the work that she does. Also, she was in 2018 the recipient of the Royal Society Athena Medal, and this was for her work campaigning on sexual misconduct in higher education. So obviously someone who's really involved in our community as well. Now, I have to say, First Light um, is also based a little bit on this book, and I was excited enough to grab a copy of this, uh, Switching on Stars at the Dawn of Time. I love the book. I loved it. I've got all the bookmarks here. You can see those things that I'm going to go back and have a look at later. It's a great book. It's all about um, these very, very first stars that you're going to hear about in the talk today. Um, and Emma does a great job of bringing that explanation to uh, a level which is suitable for scientists and non-scientists alike. So that was a really, really um, cool aspect I enjoyed of the book. Now I'm aware I'm taking up a lot of the time in the intro, so I really want to let us get started. So without any further ado, perhaps Emma, take it away with your talk on First Light. Hi, well, thank you for inviting me to uh, the York Festival. I'm really, really excited to be speaking you, to you tonight about, uh, well, my research into the first stars and uh, a little bit about the, the wider universe and the early universe as well. I think it's a, a really fascinating topic, I'm biased, but I'm hoping to convince you about something you've probably not heard of and convince you that it's uh, well worth the research that a lot of people around the world are putting into this time at the minute. So I'm an astrophysicist um, at Imperial College London. I'm a Royal Society Research Fellow. That's how this research is funded. Uh, but actually, astrophysics wasn't my first passion. I didn't grow up looking through telescopes at seven years old, and I didn't and still don't know the locations of all the constellations. Uh, what I wanted to do from six years old was be an Egyptologist. And this passion burned for a really long time, such that I even did my work experience at 15 years old, packaging 5,000 year old shoes into shoe boxes um, at a local Egyptological museum um, in Oxford. Uh, so I was very lucky to do that. And I was inspired at a young age by, well, I think it, the story that inspires many a child, which is the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Now, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb happened in the 1920s, and it was such big news because it was an intact tomb of one of the pharaohs, which is very, very hard to come by because they used to mark them with massive pyramids, so the thieves knew where to go. 
Um, but with Tutankhamun's tomb, it was under the sands. And what Howard Carter on the left here and his patron, Lord Carnarvon, found was a sealed door. And Howard Carter drilled a small hole in this door and he held up a candle and he looked through and the very impatient Lord Carnarvon said, what can you see? What can you see? And Howard Carter just replied, wonderful things, wonderful things. And later wrote that everywhere he saw the glint of gold. Now, I don't think there's a story that is more inspiring in terms of finding something about our ancient history. And it certainly inspired me for many years until I basically found a book on um, physics and, and astrophysics, astrophysics and that blew my mind so much that my whole career path changed and I ended up into physics, which is another story. But as gen in general, as a society, we're really fascinated with where we come from. We spend a long time building our family trees and asking who we were and where we came from. And this extends to archaeology and understanding our ancient history understanding even the, the animals, so not just the human species, but also many other ancient species and how life came to be, so the dinosaurs. And this is really kind of like a holy triad of childhood interests that every child goes through. They go through the history, the archeology, span the uncovering lost tomb stage. They go through the dinosaur stage. And the third part of that holy triad is of course, space. And most children go through the phase of being fascinated by the different planets, by, by rocket launchers. Uh, I mean, most children learn their counting system by not only counting upwards, but also by counting down from 10 and, and simulating rocket launchers. And it is space that I ended up in. And I would argue that our interest in space is actually, as we grow up, also an interest in our past. It's an interest in what is around us and where we came from. So how did life come to this planet? What was before the sun? What was at the start of the universe, the Big Bang? And so this is, we've also, we've all, we've also made this pursuit about our past. Now, I really want to talk to you today about very far back in our cosmological past, which is the time when the very first stars formed. And it's not a time we think about very much. Um, I think possibly because we've not had the technology to observe anything from that time um, until now, really. Um, but it's a, it's a field which is really entering its golden age in the next decade. So I'm very lucky to be in that field at the minute. And if we're going to look at the first stars and indeed the first light that came from these stars, then we need to start by understanding what is light. We grow up and live our adulthood having a very, very narrow definition of light. And that's because our eyes have evolved to see a very narrow section of the entire light spectrum. And that's the optical part of that spectrum. So your red, green, you know, violet, your rainbow basically. But there's actually lots of different kinds of light, but you will, be, you will be familiar with them in daily life. You might just not recognize them as a form of light. So for example, the radio waves from BBC Radio 2, Ken Bruce, travel to you using radio waves to your, to your, to your radio. You've got infrared light, which you might see on some cheesy American cop show where they're chasing the criminals across, across fields and they use infrared to track their body heat. You've got UV light, which you can decorate yourself if you're going to Ibiza, for example, or you can use it in, again, cheesy American cop shows to detect bodily fluids in, in various places to convict your criminals. And then you've got um, a light which we are much more familiar with, which is X-rays. And we can use all of these different kinds of light to find out different things about the world around us. So as I've said, you know, we, we find out about the UV light, the infrared, the radio that helps us learn more about our environment. And indeed x-rays as well. You wouldn't go into a doctor's surgery with a broken arm. They'd look at it under the lamp and go, eesh, that looks very broken. But you'd be pretty worried if they just 
didn't look at it in any other way, you'd be sent for an x-ray to learn more about what's inside, what's happened, and it adds information to what we already know. And these different types of light, um, they are, well, they're all light, but they are all light at different wavelengths. So the smaller the wavelength of the light, the closer it gets to x-rays, and radio light, which is what we're going to be talking about mostly today, is very long wavelength light. So light that's not, go, not got so much energy. And we can use the idea of different kinds of light to diagnose or learn different things about the universe around us as well, not just the world around us. This is a, a fairly typical galaxy. Um, you can see the halo of light from all of the stars within it. You could also see a very dusty disk. So that's all the all the the dust, the particles of you know uh, iron and things like that that are just floating around uh, that haven't been formed into planets or, or anything like that yet. And well, it it looks very nice. <laughs> Fair enough. And that's using optical light. But this is the same galaxy using radio light to to observe. And what you can see here are gigantic radio lobes in orange. Um, and what that means is that there's very strong radio light being emitted from the center of this galaxy in gigantic clouds that, that really mean that uh, the size of our galaxy has got a lot larger than we thought. And more exciting than that is when we sit down and we, we look at all the different physical processes that could possibly cause these radio lobes, really the only thing we can come up with is the idea that they are emitted from a black hole, or more accurately, the matter that is falling into the black hole and there's so much friction that it radiates out um, as radio waves. And so a optical observation of a galaxy which looks fairly nice but we can't really look inside it suddenly we can tell that there's a black hole who which are you know typically very hard to observe because they're very very black um, so we've used radio light to really diagnose something about this galaxy that we we just didn't know was there before so radio light is, is really really powerful in looking around at our universe and so we want to use all of these different lights, um, all of these different wavelengths, sorry, in observing our universe, and indeed we do, but radio light's the one for us today. And even though all of these different wavelengths produce kind of different um, abilities that we can, we, can, we can use, there's one thing in common with all of this, these wavelengths, and that's um, the speed of light. Now, the speed of light is really, really fast. You might know that it's about 300 million meters per second, which is why when you turn on the light, you see very little delay. Um, the delay is actually just from the electron, you know, your signal from the electrons getting to the light. The actual light getting to your eyes is, is infinitesimally delayed. And so you just don't notice. You can't, your, your brain just can't understand the delay so small. The so light is very fast, but it's not infinitely fast, which means that it has a value. So that doesn't matter in daily life because when your friend waves at you across the street, the light coming from that signal is so fast that you wave back almost immediately and you're not seen as rude at all. But let's consider if your friend's on the moon, let's wave at our friend on the moon. That light takes 1.3 seconds to get to the moon and 1.3 seconds to get back. So we're looking at a two and a half second delay. That's still really small. So we're probably still friends with our, our um, what lunar friend. Um, but when we go to Mars, we wave at our friend on Mars and it takes four minutes for the light to come back. And it takes four minutes to come back, by which time we're actually pretty sad because we think our friend doesn't like us anymore because it's been eight minutes and we've just wandered off. What this also means is that the light coming from our friend, as we can see here, takes four minutes to get to us. That means that we are seeing Mars and indeed our friend waving as they were four minutes in the past. So we're looking back in time. Now let's go a lot further. Let's go to one of the nearest galaxies to us, for example, Andromeda. 
The light now takes 2.5 million years to get there and 2.5 million years to get back, by which time we're not just sad, we're very dead. So that's a real problem. But this is such an advantage for astronomers because we are seeing Andromeda as it was 2.5 million years ago. So we can really look back very, very far in time and understand how our universe evolves over that time, what galaxies looked like 2.5 million years ago. Now, what's really cool about this and what really drives it home for me is let's reverse that process. Let's imagine that we have our alien observing us today, observing light coming um, from, from Earth. What they're observing is not humans wandering around playing football or whatever. They're actually observing one of the earliest ancestors of the human species. So here it's the Homo habilis. Um, you can tell that's, that's not a human <laughs> as we know it. And so Andromeda is looking back in time. Our Andromeda alien is looking back in time and seeing Earth as it was 2.5 million years ago. Pretty cool. And so in this way, we can really start to fill out what has happened before, because the further we look in distance, so the more we observe light that has traveled further to us, the more we are looking back in time. And this is what we do as astrophysicists. We, we look back in time as, as our daily job, which is nice. So we know a lot about the world around us, planet Earth, lots more to learn, of course, but we can be pretty smart. We've got a lot about Mars, a lot about the moon, even so much that, you know, we're looking at boots on Mars, which is um, just unheard of you know, 10 years ago. Uh, we can look further back in time and we can look at Andromeda, as I've just spoken about. We can go even further back and look at some of the youngest galaxies to exist in, in our cosmological timeline and really understand how they kind of started. And then we can, you know, we can look back even further. So this is not to scale. But we, with the Hubble Deep Field, we've gone about 800 million years, a billion years um, after the Big Bang. So that's, that's considering the universe is around 14 billion years old. We've gone all the way back. We've gone back 13 billion years to observe galaxies as they were back then. And as you can see in this image, um, every single bit of light in this image is a galaxy. And so there's a heck of a lot of galaxies in the universe. And what's more, this image, if you hold up a 5p piece at arm's length on the sky, and you look at the patch of sky that that blocks out, this is the patch of sky that that image is the same size as. So these galaxies, you can imagine that imprinted all over the sky and you start to start to understand how small we are, how many galaxies there are in the universe. Um, yeah, and we can go right back to 14 billion years ago. Now we don't observe the Big Bang, but what we do observe is its effects. We observe the, um, the, the, the uh, well, yeah, the effects. So for example, we have measured galaxies moving in such a way that um, it has to be an expansion. Uh, almost like you can imagine debris flying around in an explosion in an action movie. We've measured that with galaxies, where the galaxies are the debris. So that can only really happen if there's been a big explosion. And there's lots more evidence as well. But we are now really, really confident that the universe started in a Big Bang. So that's a lot of our timeline filled in. And we can be pretty smug about that. But you'll notice there's a gap. And that gap is the era of the first stars. And it covers around the first billion years of our timeline, which isn't a small chunk of a 14 billion timeline to be missing. And indeed, actually, if you compare that to a human lifetime, what that would be equivalent to missing, uh, if you made like a photograph album of your life, it would be missing everything from the day you were born until the first day of school. So if you imagine how much information is in that time, how interesting that is to you, you can understand why astrophysicists are really, really keen on filling in this era. Yeah, and so we really want to look at what happened straight after Big Bang, what was around and, and how we eventually formed these, um, 
um, first start. And it's a really enigmatic idea, the idea that you've got a very black, very dark, very boring universe with nothing happening at all to on the surface to suddenly a light being switched on and then another and then another and then another and all over the universe you have these first stars roaring to life like twinkly lights like fireflies in the night so it's, it's just a, a fabulous idea and there's a huge amount to still discover and I'm not going to go into the evidence of the Big Bang that's the moving galaxies at the minute I've just spoken about that now let's think about what was in this early universe straight after the Big Bang the Big Bang is so violent and so hot that nothing can actually survive apart from the smallest of elements, so hydrogen and helium. That's pretty much it. And you can also see lots of light, lots of photons, that's parcels of light here in the yellow. So there's lots of those about as well, so lots of radiation. And you just can't build heavier elements than that because the minute you build a heavier element than helium, it gets knocked apart by a photon going straight into it and chucking it apart or another atom going into it. It's kind of like trying to build a Duplo tower in the middle of a nursery room with 30 sugar crazed toddlers running around. You can build something tall, but it will not be very long until it's knocked over into it, into its little bricks. That's how I think about it anyway. So the first star didn't just pop out of the Big Bang. You have to make it. This is what we have to make it from. We have to make it from hydrogen and helium. So the first stars were indeed only made of these lighter elements. But we know that there were first stars because we have the idea of the Big Bang. We know that the universe began and therefore there was a first of everything, including first stars. So what else do we know about the progression over that first billion years. Why is it important to know about it? So let's talk about reasons to care. The first one is the missing data. So um, we've got the average, well not average, a, a particular possible lifetime of a human being here. Um, and now let's imagine that our alien has come down from Andromeda they're pressed for time and money like researchers on Earth, and they only have the chance to look at, for example, a nursery, a parents group uh, and a nursing home. So they go back and this is the data they go back with. And let's say they overhear the parents group telling their children that babies come from a stalk. This really fits with the data that our alien has. And so they think great, I've discovered the human lifetime, it involves a stalk, off to the pub. That's a problem, because you're missing all of that data. So missing data leads very, very quickly to incorrect conclusions. And that's one of the scientific reasons we're very concerned about missing that first billion years, is because we don't know what incorrect conclusions we're making about the rest of the cosmological timeline at the moment. One of the other reasons to care is the one that, that really gets me, which is that the first stars are extraordinary just by themselves. So it's almost like wanting to look at the ancient Egyptians because, gosh, they're just, just fundamentally very interesting. This is an image of the sun. It's a very pretty image. Uh, you can see lots of different things going on here. Uh, the sun is what helps life be sustained on Earth. It gives us light, it gives us heat. Um, it's around 6,000, very roughly Celsius on its surface, so it's nice and hot, uh, gives us our lovely summer days at the beach. Um, yeah, and that's the sun. And all of this light and all of this heat comes from a process called fusion. And at the centre of a star, I'm not going to go into it too much, but the sheer weight of all of that gas that's making up the star pushes down, pushes down onto in the core, such that those elements within it are pushed together so tightly that they fuse into heavier, heavier elements. So hydrogen becomes helium, then lithium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. You build all of these heavier elements. Um, and yeah, so, so that process releases heat and it releases light, which travels out of the star 
And that's how we power these stars. And that's the radiation that eventually comes to us. Now let's think about the first stars. This is a, uh, a mock-up of a first star that I made on PowerPoint by putting artistic filters and coloring it blue. And that's because we haven't observed the first star directly yet. Now, um, we know a fair bit amount about what they would have been like from theory, from chemistry theory and astrophysics theory. And so we know that they would have been very hot, um, even up to a million Celsius on the surface compared to the 6,000 of the sun. That's really, really hot. Um, and because they were very, very hot, they would have been a different color. So we have a relationship between the temperature and the color in astrophysics. And that hotter temperature would have mean they would have been very bluey, very bluey white. So that's a very different thing already. And the most, uh, I guess, interesting thing about the first stars, or another interesting thing, is that they're very massive. They would have been around 100 times the mass of our sun, if not up to about a thousand times. This is really, really massive. So we're talking about um, two, a few very different things now already from, for example, a, a fairly average star like our sun. And they might also be extinct. And this is the reason, um, sorry, this is because there is a really handy relationship in astrophysics, astrophysics, which relates the lifetime of a star to its mass. And that's because the more massive your star, the quicker it guzzles through all of that fuel, guzzles through that hydrogen um, for fusion. And so it lives a much shorter lifetime. So a first star would be expected to have a lifetime of around 1 million years. Whereas um, a star like our sun is going to live for around 9 billion years, of which we're about halfway through at the minute. So our sun is middle aged. Um, yeah. And so we have every reason to believe that actually the first stars are extinct, that they haven't survived until the current day, which makes them really interesting as well. Just like the ancient Egyptians, you know, they're not around today. We can't talk to Cleopatra down the pub and find out all about um, what was going on. Though, of course, I think we're closer to Cleopatra in time than she is to the, the Great Pyramids, which I always find fascinating, but that's an aside. So we have two reasons to care now. Let's think about the third. This is that the first stars changed the universe completely. And we can think about this because they're a very different kind of star in a different way. And I guess this is actually the most important one, the difference. And this is because we can call them not just first stars, but metal free stars. And we can categorize the stars that we see around us into these three categories. So you have the first stars, which are metal free. And then you have um, younger stars, which are metal poor. And we can observe lots of these in the Milky Way. And then you've got the metal rich stars, such as the sun. Um, and you can observe lots of these in, in the Milky Way as well. And by metals, we don't just mean, um, you know, the, the rings on your fingers, the, the silver, the gold, platinum, whatever you've got in your jewelry box. Um, we are used to rounding up so much in astrophysics. We have huge distances. We have huge temperatures. We have um, huge cosmological times. We're rounding up all the, all the while, you know, plus or minus a few hundred million, still good. We've rounded up the periodic table of elements too. So here's hydrogen, here's helium. And as I said to you, that's actually what most of the universe is made from. So everything else we call metals, it just makes it easier on a daily basis as an astrophysicist. So we have hydrogen, we have helium, metals, our periodic table, nice and easy. Sorry if you're a chemist, it will cause huge offense. So when we talk about metals, we're talking about the metal free stars being made, being com when they form, being composed just of hydrogen and helium. And then as fusion occurs, it starts to produce these, these metals. And so that as we get younger and younger, we have more and more metals made. We go to metal poor and then metal rich. So this actually shows an evolution of stars. 
in our universe over time in different generations being made and it's it's the first stars which create these metals which convert the universe from being just hydrogen and helium which you really can't do that much with to using fusion to create lithium boron carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine neon all of these different um heavier elements up to iron and when these first stars die only a million years after the big bang poof in a huge well, not, it's more of a bang. <laughs> um, you get these these elements flung out into the local universe, and they pollute this pristine gas of hydrogen and helium very, very quickly, such that immediately the next star that forms from that gas is already a metal poor star. So you cannot form a metal free star from anything other than that first gas, very, very first time in our universe. So we have every reason to believe that they are extinct because you just can't form them in a universe which has been polluted. Um, and our universe is very polluted today <laughs> with these metals. So it's the first stars that are responsible for going from a very black, very boring universe to a universe that is full of structure, full of gorgeous different types of galaxies merging, as you can see at the bottom one here. You've got a beautiful spiral right on the left, a very small one that you can see in the background. You've got, you know, different types of galaxies, different colours, huge diversity. This is that Hubble Space Telescope image blown up. And you can see all of these different galaxies. And I have this on my wall as a metre by metre canvas. And I just find myself still staring at it and getting completely lost. And I always see a new galaxy every time I look at it that, that fascinates me. Um, yeah, so it's the first stars that are responsible for, um, for producing these first metals, which go, that are then, that are ne then enable the formation of galaxies and planets and eventually us. So as you may have heard, there's a famous quote, we are made of stardust. And it's absolutely true. So the first stars were extraordinary. There's a really good reason for wanting to go after these, to find more about it. And the aim, of course, is to not just have an approximate knowledge of this time, but to really know about it, not just have a PowerPoint image, but something much more solid. And how do we do that? Well, the first way is that we look back in time. As I've said, this is something that we do every day as astrophysicists. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I ended up in this field uh, was because uh, when I read about how we do this as astrophysicists, as I said, my mind was blown. And I realized that I didn't just have to look at opening tombs 5,000 years ago. I could look at opening tombs 13 billion years ago. I could look at a missing time in our universe, look back and drill through, hold up a candle, see what was in there and really understand what was going on. And we do this, as I've said, by, by tuning into light that has traveled so far that it's actually 13 billion years old. Um, and by the time it gets to us, this light has really had to fight the expansion of the universe. It's really lost a heck of a lot of energy. It's been drawn out to longer wavelengths such that we don't use optical telescopes as you might be used to like Hubble, we use radio telescopes, which are very different kinds of technology. This is a radio telescope. It's one that I'm helping to build at the minute in the Western Australian desert. Um, and it's called the Square Kilometre Array. So it's going to form a lot of our science in the next decade, but actually it's going to be observing for the next 50 years. Uh, and this is what we call a Christmas tree antenna for obvious reasons. Um, and it's this kind of technology, and there's nothing special about this metal. This isn't metal developed by NASA. This is uh, just metal <laughs> in a desert. But the infrastructure required to get one of these radio telescopes to work is, is quite incredible. The computers we need um, are amazing. We've only just kind of developed the technology to do this because the data rate coming from observing the whole sky in radio basically just blows up most computers. 
um, and very quickly, this is the one that I, I use in the Netherlands currently, um, and it's, it's called a bow tie antenna. So you can see they're very, very different. And what we do is we join up lots and lots of different antennas over the whole of Western Australia to make the equivalent of a gigantic telescope the size of Western Australia, which of course you can't do with um, a dish or a lens. So it's a very powerful method and we can listen in very carefully. And there's lots of telescopes all over the world racing to make this um, first detection. And I'm just going to speed up a little bit because there's something else I really, really want to tell you at the end of this. Uh, and the way we do this by looking back in time is that we tune into this light. So kind of like yellow photons that you see here that have traveled 13 billion years. We tune into those, those wavelengths and we take the temperature. We take the temperature of that light such that we can understand what the temperature was like of the hydrogen gas all that time back. And we can tell that very early on it's very cold because there's nothing around to heat it up. Then as the first stars form, they heat them up with their heat and their light and their radiation. And so you see the, the, the temperature of that gas go up. And so we can get our first data point, which is when those first stars formed. So we now understand that it's about 180 million years after the Big Bang. And then when the first galaxies came around, they actually um, destroyed all of the hydrogen atoms with their such strong radiation. Suddenly we can't take the temperature of it at all because there's just no photons getting to us. And so we can tell when these first galaxies formed as well. So there's lots more that we can do, but this is what we've done so far. And now we're working on actually imaging this time such that we don't just have points, but we have um, a, uh, an image of this, of this time. And we can make a home movie of the first billion years with a square kilometer array. And I'm going to tell you very quickly about um, another area, which you can see why it drew me in, because it's called stellar archaeology. And this is the idea that we can't, we don't just look back in time, but there's another way. We can actually find the artifacts. We can find what this civilization of first stars left. And we do that by looking at the first stars that may have survived until the current day. Now, I told you that the first stars are probably an extinct species, but in the last few years, um, we've really pinned down that actually, as the first stars form, very massive entities in the kind of leftover gas around them, we're starting to see in our models that actually we get much smaller sibling stars. And these sibling stars would have been around the size of our sun. And so they might still be around today if we can find one small enough that they, they've survived for 13 billion years. Now, it's not as simple as looking around the Milky Way and going, there's one because while they formed in a very pristine universe of, of no metals, they've been hanging around the neighborhood for 13 billion years. And so they would be camouflaged by the metals that they've just, the creatures they've, 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 as they've gone along. So the stellar archeologist's job is to look at stars around them and dust off those metals, look at the light, determine what metals are around and figure out whether Yes, you know what, that could just be camouflage. And we're getting really close. We found a second generation star, so the first, so where they've only got one ancestor, the first star formed the gas which they formed from. So we're getting very, very, very close. Oh, that's a, okay. <laughs> but it's very, very hard. Um, and as I've mentioned, well, sorry, as I haven't mentioned, Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter didn't just stumble upon Tutankhamun's tomb. What they did was they bought a permit and Howard Carter searched for five years over a grid that he put down. He found nothing, nothing, nothing. At which point Lord Carnarvon said, look, mate, I've given you a heck of a lot of money. It's been five years. I'm cutting you off. Nothing more. Howard Carter begged for one more season. And guess what happened? One dig and he found Tutankhamun. So it can take time and you have to be really, but the reward is, is worth it. And so you have to, that's what we're doing as stellar archaeologists. We're basically gridding up where we're most likely to see these stars. And I don't have time to go through this, but we are looking at the light that comes from these stars, determining whether they've got this kind of camouflage level of metals. 
but it's hard and it is going to take time and it is going to take money but the reward for you know when we detect these first stars fill in that first billion years it's incredible science and it's done with almost crude technology like these antennas and yet we make incredible discoveries like when the first stars formed and there's so much more to come in the next decade so i really hope you've enjoyed this talk um shameless plug for the book that i have written on this topic um it includes lots of information about the topics i've talked today and lots of information about a lot more that's exciting that's going on so thank you very much um, I hope you really um, have enjoyed this talk and it's available now at Amazon and Waterstones and any independent bookshop that you use. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Emma. That was a great, great introduction to the first stars. And I can say, because I've read it <laughs> from the book, there's a lot more information and a lot more really cool details as well along the way. Like, like the analogy that you make with um, Howard Carter and the discovery of Tutankhamun, there's lots of really other nice stories that we can use to um, understand some of those really complex astrophysics. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I kind of just, I guess I find it really complex <laughs> as well to begin with, and then I have to come up with all of these stories and analogies to really understand what's happening in my mind, and then they just stick, <laughs> and I always go back to them. Fantastic. Well, I've got loads of questions, but we've got some great questions from the audience here today as well. So I'll, uh, I'll go through some of those and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about these great first stars. Uh, first of all, I guess this is a background question. This is from Richard. Uh, Richard asks, with all these points of light out there from all those stars and galaxies, why is the night sky still dark? Yeah, absolutely fantastic question. And it was a question that has been asked for thousands of years. It's called Olbasser's paradox. It's spelled O-L-B-E-R. Um, and even Edwin, Edward Allan Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, so I'm going, all my names wrong today. Even Edgar Allan Poe wrote a poem about why is the sky dark? Because surely if there's so many stars and the universe is, you know, full of them, every line of sight should land on a star. And so the, the nighttime sky should be bright as the sun. Um, the problem is, is that even though there has been lots of stars, the universe um, isn't infinite in time. It does, it was born. And so simply not enough time has passed for all of these stars to be created, which would create this complete brightness across the sky. So you can imagine in the future that might happen, but the problem is, is that current generations would all die. And so you just wouldn't get that effect. But yes, the reason that the night sky is dark is because the Big Bang, the time between the Big Bang, there simply hasn't been enough stellar formation for that, for that to be true. Absolutely, cool. Yeah, look up Olbus's paradox, though, because it goes into it in, in quite a lot of detail. Uh, and it's a fun paradox. It's, it's one I use in my introduction to my book, actually, because it is one of the most fundamental questions I think we can ask. So drilling down a little bit closer to what you talked about, um, Jessica's asking, even though the first stars may no longer exist, could we still see them if they're far enough away and the light is still traveling towards us? Yeah, another great question. Um, the problem is, is that the light traveling to us will be so faint that we simply won't be able to catch it with optical telescopes that we have today or, or anywhere that we can imagine in the future, actually. One way that we could see them is um, when they die, they die in these incredibly bright explosions and the brightest explosions that you can get in the universe and if that light travels towards us and gets what's called lensed around a galaxy in the middle so it kind of just means magnified then that magnified dying light <laughs> could be picked up by um, one of our newest telescopes, the James Webb Space Telescope. So that is one thing that the JWST will be looking for. It's a long shot and it won't be a living star we see, it will be their deaths. But I quite like that because I'm aiming to see their births 
the JWST is aiming to see their deaths and stellar archaeology is aiming to kind of see them alive at the minute. So we've got these three incredible complementary methods. Fabulous. Um, I think this is a really natural question, actually, that comes about when you talk about the first stars. So I'm glad Malcolm's asked it. Um, Malcolm asks, were, were the first stars grouped into galaxies? Yeah. Um, no, is the, is the answer. So it depends how you define a galaxy. So the way that astronomers define a galaxy is a group of stars. It has to include dark matter because um, that kind is kind of what binds the galaxy and make sure everything doesn't fling off. But you also have to make, it, make sure it's not a transient object. And what that means is that that galaxy has to survive events like the supernova of these stars dying. So if there's a supernova and the whole thing flies apart, it's just not a galaxy because it, it can't cope with it. Now, with the first stars, yes, you would have had a gathering of first stars, you know, maybe up to 10, that kind of thing. Um, there would have been some dark, a little bit of dark matter, but as soon as one of these huge supernovae, and they are massive, happened with these first stars, the whole thing would have blown apart. Um, and you have to remember that they live such short lifetimes that there isn't time for more and more and more and more stars and dark matter together to prevent that happening. So they all die, but then the gas from that forms the second generation stars. And these second generation stars live much longer lifetimes. Um, so they have much, uh, much longer time to gather together and coalesce with other galaxies. And then you've got a second generation galaxy. But no, you wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have, would have had these first stars in a galaxy. And that really nicely leads to another question, because you, you showed us one of the stars that was the second generation star. Uh, so Neil's asking, how many generations has a typical star undergone? Oh, really open question in science at the minute. So it's on, you know, we don't have an answer, but it's going to be on the order of five, 10, as opposed to a thousand, a hundred because these stars live so long after that first star then actually if you think about it you only need a couple of generations even to get to a star like our sun and i think they did do this with the sun and it was something something like three like you know so it really is on that order because because they just live so long billions of years by the second generation so it's very low you'd think it would be like you know with 13 billion years you're thinking my God, it's going to be like a billion generations, but it's it's really not. That's yeah. why I find it fascinating. We're really closely related. <laughs> That's really nice. Um, Richard's got a uh, sorry, uh, no, it's Graham who's got this question. Uh, why is it thought that the first stars were very massive? Those big blue stars that you talked about. Okay, so this is to do with uh, what's called cooling mechanisms in the stars. So let me get my, my chemistry brain on. Okay, so because you've just got what's called atomic hydrogen, so just singular hydrogen atoms in the very early universe, the only way you can cool your gas is by um, them kind of colliding and what's called a, a atomic line releasing a photon and that photon goes away. That's not a very efficient way of losing heat. And so you don't lose as much heat, which means that the gas cloud stays very hot, very puffy. Um, and so when it begins to fuse in the middle, it's still very, very large. Stars today, because they've got metals in them, they've got access to what's called metal line cooling. And without going into the chemistry, it means that when you have collisions and things, and when you have all your electrons moving up and down atomic lines, they release lots and lots and lots of photons, and they all leave the star system, which means that their gas cloud contracts and contracts and contracts, and so you get smaller stars. So it, again, it's all to do with what ingredients you've got in the early universe, and those first stars have nothing pretty much to work with and so they ended up being being very massive and very hot 
Awesome. Now we've got a few questions on the same sort of topic and it's a topic that I think that the uh, general public are really interested in. I'm really interested in it. Most astronomers are, it's really exciting. And um, it's about dark matter. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask Frida's question here. Uh, did dark matter exist before the first stars? Yep, they absolutely didn't. They're responsible for the first stars. So in the early universe, very early universe, I might have described it as very black, very boring, nothing to look at. But actually, if you had your dark matter lenses on, what you would see is a spider's web of dark matter, which existed since the Big Bang. And it's filaments, it's junctions, it's big spherical balls of, of dark matter all over. And what happens is the hydrogen gas that is originally everywhere in the universe, it starts to get attracted gravitationally. And so we've got these incredible simulations which show the dark matter web and then the hydrogen overlaying this web perfectly because it's all being gravitationally attracted in. And it's within these junctions um, and really dense parts of dark matter that you get enough hydrogen coming together to spark a first star. So dark matter is absolutely essential for um starting the uh the locations of these areas of the of the first stars um dark matter does come in later to um into first star science as well for we we think that dark matter annihilation creates ionizing photons which um ionizes the hydrogen and gives us kind of like a marker to look for um and the edges results where we found that the hydrogen was twice as cold as we thought. The only thing hanging around there is dark matter. So it could be that dark matter was colliding with the hydrogen, which would be unbelievable because dark matter is like famous for not interacting with anything. So if we found something that it interacts with, that is, that is amazing. So there's lots of work going on there across all fields because that would be just paradigm shifting. Isn't it crazy that something that we just have almost zero understanding of is still responsible for everything in our universe, from yep. including the very first stars? It's starting to get a bit embarrassing, Emma. We need to sort this out. Yeah, it is. We need to get on that. <laughs> um, I've got this question, and I think from in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking back to your in your talk, you had the, the lovely pictures of the washing on the line with the pure, pristine white. Um, laundry and then going into the dirty dark soil and laundry of the, the stars being polluted. And I think this relates to Michael's question, which is, are there areas of pure hydrogen with no metal dust in some parts of our galaxy? If so, should we expect uh, giant massive metal free stars to form here in our own galaxy? So I think what this question is saying is, are there islands of pristine neutral hydrogen, which have a man which have managed to survive to this day from being polluted. We've not had a simulation where that has been true. What we have had a simulations of is where you have these pockets, these surviving islands, only say a billion years ago. Or 500 million years ago and they survive there's a possibility of very late population three um star formation there but again they live very short lifetimes so we wouldn't see them um it's an area it's something that would be very hard to achieve but is absolutely possible so it's a great question it's it is something that is is being pursued now but i can't give you a good answer for it well, I guess on the topic of things that for the future that are being pursued, I wanted to ask, you sort of allude in your book to um, that there might be some really hidden gems in the LOFAR data that you're looking at that you think you're kind of on the verge of discovering some really interesting things about the very early universe. My, I've got two questions. How close are we? <laughs> Have you got it yet? <laughs> or how far away are we? <laughs> Golden question. So during my PhD, 10, year, 10 plus years ago, um, I was told that we'd, we'd get, we'd kind of figure it out then. <laughs> um, what, what LOFAR is, is an incredibly complex machine, telescope, 
which is what we call the pathfinder. So it's a test ground for this square kilometre array. So what it is really is, is an instrument where we find every problem there could be and try and iron it out. And so this decade has been <laughs> finding problem after problem after problem. Now, in the last two years, we think we're there. We think we can, we can start getting there. But what we have is 10 years of legacy data, which is, is, is a lot of data. And so now we've kind of like got our golden standard analysis pipeline. We have to shove all of that data through and it takes 13 hours to process every hour ob ob observation. Um, this takes people power. We do not have people power because research money from governments is sparse. Um, I would like to say it would be within the next year or two. Um, that's my gut feeling because we have got to this point, but that's a gut feeling. I can't say more than that, but we are getting so close. We're getting every, every paper that comes out, whether it's from MWA in Western Australia, GMRT, not so much in India. Um, yeah, but mainly MWA. Uh, we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer down, 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 down to where we think the signal will be in the in the analysis framework that we're using. I'll give you an answer. I wish I could, but it's it's not going to be ten years. It's you know it's going to be a couple of years. And even if it becomes a bit of a struggle, we have we have defined and solved so many problems that the square kilometre array, which is a far superior instrument, will hit the ground running. And that will that will observe things 10 times faster. So what took us 10 years, it will take a year. That's amazing. I mean, I don't think a year or two is actually a bad thing. I think that's really exciting to be on the verge of a discovery that's so soon. That's, yeah. That's we used to waiting a lot longer than that in science. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we waited 10 years. We can wait another few. <laughs> so I think this leads us to a really nice place to start to wrap up. I think if, if you if we're going to have this massive discovery about the universe that's going to come out in the next few years, fingers crossed, let's do it. <laughs> um, then your book is a really great introduction to that because it helped me really understand where that pursuit is going. So I know this is a shameless plug again, but I'm going to do it because I, I did really genuinely enjoy the book and it really does make me really optimistic and Thank you. excited about these first That was the aim. I wanted to pass my enthusiasm and my optimism for this, for this subject. And I couldn't believe no one had written about it. It's when I found out that I was like, well, I've got to write about it because this is one of the most exciting topics in science. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I did honestly it comes through on every page it's brilliant so if you want to grab a copy of first light uh, switching on stars at the dawn of time there's a lovely link in the chat window to one of the independent booksellers which is supporting the festival of ideas so I do recommend that you have a uh, look in that book there otherwise just a few other couple of things to wrap up with uh, first of all, let's give a wonderful, big, loud, virtual round of applause for Emma. Thank you so much. Yay. I'm sure there's lots of people coming together um, all across, uh, behind monitors across the UK and beyond right now, which is really exciting. And thank um, you. Thank you for first reading my book <laughs> and, uh, yeah, introducing me and, and guiding the questions in a really, really lovely way. Excellent, thank you. Um, so if you want to have, come back to the recording of this event, it's going to be up on the Festival Ideas YouTube channel, which uh, you'll see in the Watch Again section of the festival website. It's going to come up sometime after tomorrow, probably sometime next week. Um, if you signed up and got your ticket for this event, you'll be contacted by email when that video is up and live. And we hope that you have enjoyed the events and the festival ideas so far. I've been uh, at several and it's been super amazing. There are a few more events, so if you want to check them out, so look at the website for full details of upcoming events. Um, if there's any super relevant ones, I think they're about to appear in the chat window as well. If you want to share your thoughts on this event or any of the others, then if you're a Twitter person, then you can go to hashtag York Ideas to share your thoughts. Otherwise, thank you everybody for coming along today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Saturday and beyond. Thank you so much.